core international crimes, that's the topic of today's talk. And for that, I'm joined by Selina Ganescu, who is the Deputy National Member for Germany and Vice Chair of Eurojust Counterterrorism Team, and Matthias Pesdirt, who is the head of the Genesis Network Secretariat here at Eurojust. So, uh, Matthias, core international crimes, uh, this sounds like a very broad, a very general term. Could you explain a little bit more what exactly are core international crimes? With this th term, we try to encompass three crimes, and these are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crime of genocide. And I'll explain a bit on, on which, um, which they are. So war crimes, um, we, with this definition, we encompass uh, conduct and acts and violations that occur in times of an armed conflict. It means that when we have a fighting between either two states or within a state as a civil war, but between warring parties. And in, in that terminology, of course, acts that are prohibited because even wars have limitations. You cannot kill civilian, you cannot kill a wounded soldier and so on and so forth. Um, those acts are described or, or defined as war crimes. Crimes against humanity are different. They can happen either in, in the time of a conflict, but can happen also in a peacetime. But the most important is that the crimes against humanity are um, a widespread or systematic attack against civilians. So it means massive violation of human rights. Often we see uh, crimes against humanity in times of um, uh, oppressive regimes, so in countries where there is a really oppressive regime, when there is enormous amount of, of, of detention centers, torture happening on a wild scale um, in that country, um, or rapes in, in, in detentions and so on. Um, while the crime of genocide is, is, we call it, the most horrendous crime, because it actually intends, uh, with, with this definition, it's the intention to destroy a group. So there is a specific group and there is a, a clear intention from the other group, so there is distinction between those two groups on either ethnicity or, or race or, or uh, religion, to destroy that group. That's what we've seen um, similar, the last kind of examples we've seen in, in, in terms of um, ISIS crimes against uh, Yazidis, when there was an intention to destroy that whole population um, and then uh, kill the man and, and you know, separate the population by execution of men. And, and then taking uh, uh, females as, as slaves or as uh, uh, household assistants and so on. So Eurojust does not investigate these crimes itself, but it helps national authorities to do so. Um, how does this work in practice, Selina? Uh, yes, of course. So Eurojust itself is not an investigative body. We are not a prosecution office ourselves, but we are being asked by the national authorities for help and for assistance whenever they see that international cooperation is needed. They turn to us. We are available 24-7. We have a so-called um, on-call coordination service. So it means we are available around the clock on every day of the week in case that our authorities need us. Um, if they ask us for support, we um, open cases here at Eurojust. We facilitate um, the communication with the relevant counterparts in the other national authority systems. So because we have all the national desks of the European Union here, we also have liaison prosecutors here for certain states. It's very easy for us with our colleagues here at Eurojust to identify who might be working in the parallel investigation, who might need to be contacted to bring the parties together. Because in most of the cases, because of the atrocity of the crimes that we are faced in this specific field, there is a common interest worldwide to prosecute and bring justice, right? So um, this is our job, to facilitate that communication. We organize coordination meetings. We have all the facilities here. We have the means here and we have the knowledge here to organize meetings. For a lot of prosecutors, it's very important that they can speak in their mother tongue because it's like very delicate, you know, very delicate factual circumstances need to be discussed, legal distinctions need to be made. So for them, it's important that they can speak in their mother tongue because the law and the legal system can be quite complicated and tricky. So it's better for them. We provide the translation and uh, we provide the facilities and the secure environment for them to exchange confidential and very delicate 
uh, matters. Matthias, um, since you play such a crucial role, as Selina said, um, can you give an example, a recent example of, um, of a case where the Genocide Network Secretariat was involved? In, in terms of cases, it's, I think, absolutely um, um, important to, to stress the relevance uh, that both the network and, and Euro just played in uh, bringing accountability for the crimes committed in Syria. Um, as we all know, the conflict in Syria started in 2011. And already in the next year, 2012, we had specific ad hoc meetings of, of the genocide network that dealt with this situation. And we invited UN Commission of Inquiry, specialized NGOs uh, already operating in that theater, um, to bring information uh, closer to the, to the prosecutors. We were already aware at that point that due to the proximity of area, uh, there will be uh, uh, future cases um, on, on EU, um, in the EU courts. And that's exactly where we continued to work on that year by year. And then later on, that turned into those discussions became much more concrete and precise, and they turned into a uh, case at Eurojust, which uh, materialized later on in 2018 by uh, a JIT between France and Germany. And then basically with those two countries, later on uh, that work um, materialized in arrests, and as uh, um, we, we all know later on by conviction of two perpetrators, and that was very significant to have first time ever conviction of a Syrian official for crimes committed by Syrian regime uh, in Syria against Syrians. You already mentioned that for achieving concrete results it is very important to work together with international partners. Um, which are the most important partners for Eurojust in that? When we talk about accountability and bringing justice to, to victims, it's not only national law enforcement and judiciary. There is a plethora of other um, stakeholders and other partners that we need to work. And here we go from, from uh, non-governmental organizations or civil society organizations. Uh, they, they do an excellent job uh, in documenting these crimes and then basically supporting national authorities um, in bringing evidence. We need to, to mention also specialized UN bodies like UN commissions of inquiry or fact-finding missions. Uh, but also recently the three established uh, mechanisms by UN. So uh, IIIM, mechanism for Syria, then UNITAD, which is mechanism for crimes uh, that were committed by ISIS, um, and the most recent one, the UN mechanism for Myanmar. And these are all specialized bodies uh, which uh, with high standards collect uh, information that can be used later on by national prosecutor authorities. We also um, should not, uh, of course, forget the, the main body, which is the ICC as well, which kind of um, embodies the international criminal justice. We work with, with the Office of the Prosecutor as well. Um, and, uh, of course, on national level, we should not forget but also on national level, there is a lot of uh, coordination and cooperation between immigration authorities, uh, investigative authorities, prosecutorial authorities, ministries of justice, ministries of foreign affairs, and so on and so forth. So in order to be able to bring justice and to address accountability, we really need to work beyond our own um, specific uh, environment. So we work in sort of an ecosystem with other partners, with other actors, um, and only by that we can actually uh, fill the, the, the missing puzzles um, and bring um, the, the, the important picture, which is actually then the case, uh, to the courtroom and prove beyond reasonable doubt uh, that these crimes have occurred, um, even if they occurred outside the territory where the uh, trial uh, takes place. Since February, we hear a lot about core international crimes in relation to the ongoing war in Ukraine. Selina, can you explain a little bit more about Eurojust's role when it comes to Ukraine? Um, Eurojust in this regard is, was also been asked by national authorities investigating possible war crimes committed on Ukrainian, Ukrainian territory to support the national authorities to help several different countries who are already prosecuting or investigating to come together to exchange information because the amount and the volume of evidence and information that could possibly lead to investigating, to prosecution, maybe e even possible conviction 
is available in so many different member states by now that of course the national authorities they see the need to cooperate and because they are experienced offices usually dealing with so these sort of investigations they turn to Eurojust because they have they might have worked with us before and they know that we can build the very crucial link and this was a um, situation in which uh, a quick reaction was also uh, necessary. Matthias, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Indeed, um, as Selena mentioned, because we have the prosecutors here and we have basically the structure, the organization, the basis for cooperation, Eurojust with the network was able to quickly respond to the situation in Ukraine. So the conflict started, uh, the aggression started end of, uh, end of February and already at the beginning of March there was first coordination meeting uh, that engaged all countries uh, um, present at Eurojust to look into the situation. Later on the Genocide Network also looked um, um, in, the, in the situation and how to work with, uh, with civil society organizations and a month after the, the start of the aggression there was a, a JIT joint investigation team signed uh, between uh, Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania that actually later on succeeded also other countries but most importantly also the um, Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And that is unprecedented that we have a composition on with the international uh, accountability um, body and national accountability uh, bodies, meaning uh, national authorities and, and uh, Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to really work together um, in addressing accountability for uh, the crimes committed in Ukraine. And the joint investigation team is not the only service that uh, Eurojust provides and not the only support that Eurojust provides. What else is there? Correct. Uh, Eurojust's work on, on in relation to the, to, the, to the aggression in Ukraine focuses on both on the committed core international crimes, so war crimes, crimes against humanity, but um, also on the um, sanctions that have been imposed on uh, Russian individuals and, uh, and companies. And that's something that uh, um, Eurojust is involved in the season freeze task force that actually looks into uh, how best to, to implement these sanctions um, and uh, materialize them. Eurojust is, has also a central role when it comes to the gathering of evidence of the alleged war crimes in Ukraine. Selina, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that role. Um, because of the complexity and the amount of the evidence already, let's say, in the world about the incidents happening in Ukraine. Um, we saw an operation and a need to, to, to centralize and collect this evidence at a hub at Eurojust here. This is why we were mandated to create the so-called CSAT, with, which is a database for evidence of core international crimes having been committed. So CSAT stands for Core International Crimes Evidence Database. Database, exactly. Okay, and this is a, a central repository that is located at Eurojust. And uh, wh where does the information come from? It is foreseen that the information will come from the national authorities. The national authorities will transmit this information to Eurojust so that we can create an overview, we can structure and systematize this information to make it better available for the national authorities. Also with the aim to avoid possible duplication of interrogation of witnesses, for example. And this information, this can be what, like pictures or videos or what kind of information do we, do we save there? Yes, it can be, it, it should be digital uh, information, let's say, but uh, it can be um, everything that you have just mentioned, yes. And what will happen with that? You said we are, um, Eurojust is creating a sort of overview of that. And uh, what's going to happen next with that overview? What is it used for and by whom? It will, be, um, it will be used by the national authorities. The, the idea behind is that the national authorities, they will concentrate probably on certain incidents or locations. And then they know where to turn to, to ask, well, we would like to investigate this particular incident. Does Eurojust have already information provided by other national authorities that can substantiate our allegations, let's say? So uh, it creates also, it creates the bigger picture of what has happened, but it also creates a very detailed picture of uh, incidents that will eventually, may eventually end up in court. Yes, so that the national authorities are better informed 
which evidence is available somewhere else, which will also lead to the question, who will investigate this particular incident or this particular person? So Eurojust is setting up a, a completely new structure there, a completely new repository. Is this something that will only be used for what is happening in Ukraine or does this have a, a bigger scope? The work done at this moment at Eurojust will have effect for the coming years and not only for the situation and the conflict in Ukraine, but also for any other conflicts. And that's really important because with the new Eurojust mandate, will have additional possibilities to really support national authorities. And uh, again, goes for the conflict that already occurred whatever, or, or the conflict that will happen. So we can collect in with this or we can uh, receive information and store and analyze for the past conflicts or for the future one. And that's really important to stress because um, with this capacity, the support to national authorities will, will uh, increase. One element that you mentioned before that is very important is uh, working together with uh, civil society organizations. Um, for working together with them, you developed a, spe a special tool, so to say. Can you elaborate a little bit? As a result of the uh, start of the, of the armed conflict in, in Ukraine, many NGOs were put into unprecedented situation where they were basically um, needed to respond to the mass atrocities that occurred. And we all saw uh, horrible videos of destruction of civilian objects and, and executions and, and uh, um, so on. And of course, um, the importance was how C, uh, CSOs, or as you, as you said, the civil society organizations, how they document. Um, what we want to avoid is um, that one witness would be asked 20 times the same question, because that can lead to, to uh, remote tra traumatization, um, can have effect of that um, witness or victim also for the future court trials. Um, we want to, and that's what we and, um, basically work together with the Office of the Prosecutor of the OICC, to use the already existing manuals and handbooks provided by CSOs, but we put that together in a one single document, which we published very recently. It's called the Guidelines for CSOs on Documenting um, Core International Crimes for Accountability Purposes, um, in which we basically give sort of um, a um, guidance on how, um, how best to collect this um, information, how to document, um, to be uh, used later on in the court proceedings. Um, and that's a, a really an important uh, document that we also now work closely with CSOs to see how best to implement it and also to receive their feedback on this document as well. So just like with the evidence repository, this is also something that is not merely limited to uh, what is going on in Ukraine, but that has a wider scope, a global scope for other conflicts as well, right? Absolutely, absolutely. This is applicable to any um, CSO that uh, operates in, in this uh, environment of, of documenting crimes. Um, it's um, applicable to any conflict or any um, uh, situation of massive human rights violation. Um, we're receiving extremely positive feedback um, after the publication was launched um, and uh, we're looking uh, very much uh, forward to engage uh, closer with CSOs in, the, um, in implementing and uh, to receive their feedback as well. We have heard now that core international crimes are some of the most grave, most severe crimes committed. Selina, if I may ask you a personal question. Um, in your job, you deal with some of the worst things that people can do to each other. How do you cope with that personally? And how do you still keep your faith in, in humanity? Thank you for this question. So I would like first to highlight that we at Eurojust, we are not in the courtroom. We are not the ones to be faced directly with the victims or their relatives. We are not the ones going through the file folder seeing this horrible pictures or videos even. But still, my motivation is based on two things. First, it's humanity. And for me, this, in this includes uh, bringing justice to the victims and their relatives. So this is, this is the aim I have as a prosecutor by professional background. And this, this is what motivates me. But also, it's about the team. 
when I see the prosecutors coming to Eurojust, the war crime prosecutors working together and they are facing difficult legal obstacles, practical obstacles, operational obstacles, but they, they will overcome them in order to prosecute and to achieve convictions. This motivates me. And Matthias, how is it for you? What keeps you motivated? We also need to acknowledge that this is not about being tough in this work, but it's also about professionalism, dedication and motivation. Of course, there also need to be supporting mechanism because we have seen that either investigators or prosecutors can develop so-called secondary trauma and they do need um, um, uh, psychotherapists as well in order to support them on a regular basis. But that's part of the work and part of the business. But what we need to, to um, emphasize is that uh, what also Selena mentioned is the joy to bring conviction and in that way uh, to address the accountability and what you see then in victims of those crimes. We need to understand this these crimes are, are horrible rapes, tortures, murders, the most biblical uh, stories, if we put it that way. But um, at the end, it's really the, the dedication, motivation um, of individuals, um, of um, um, investigators, prosecutors, who commit uh, their, their work to, this, uh, to bring the justice to victims. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you, Selina. Thanks for being here today.